Well, um, I think the first thing we're looking for is his appointments. Who is he appointing and where? Um, and are these guys capable of putting together not only their own plan, but also adhering to the campaign promises? So that's the first sign I would look at. I would then look at things like, um, like the tax policy uh, that Trump has put out. Do we see a receptive legislative branch to those sorts of changes to tax policy and also the fiscal stimulus around uh, uh, infrastructure? Do we see that coming out? Now, this stuff uh, is going to take uh, probably a year to really implement, especially around, say, infrastructure, um, to start spending. So in my view, the rally is really early. I mean, it's optimistic. It's a great thing to see. But this is a very early rally, given how long it's going to take for this stuff to, to play out. Fair point, Tony. Now, in your op-ed in the Asian, Nikkei Asian Review, rather, you wrote that the U.S. pivot to Asia hasn't paid off in terms of concrete outcomes. And yet, you mentioned that a Trump administration may do better. How does the president-elect position the U.S. in this changing region? Sure. Uh, frankly, I think the pivot has been so poorly received and so poorly executed that it wouldn't be hard for Trump to... Um, to do better, okay? So I think the first thing that's provided is clarity around the U.S. position. Whenever you come to a negotiating table, there has to be an understanding of the starting point of negotiations. Um, I think looking at things like the Chinese relationship, the U.S. has been treating China like they treated the Soviet Union during the Cold War, which is kind of, it's all bad. Now, China is a very sophisticated diplomatic player, and you can talk with them on multiple levels. So the U.S. needs a much more sophisticated approach uh, to talking with China as well. I think with Japan, um, you know, the U.S. needs to take a different view on Japan as well. I mean, some of the monetary policy that the Japanese have advocated over the past four years has really damaged places like Korea and China. And so I think the U.S. really needs to focus on Japan and have them own up to the fact that their monetary policy really isn't getting them what they need and have them stop hurting the exports of other players in Northeast Asia. Now, Tony, speaking of the Middle Kingdom, you've also raised the advantages of including China in a multinational investment accord. Now, how would this coexist with an integrating ASEAN, mm -hmm. the AIIB, or alternate trade agreements and the persistent South China Sea disputes? Sure. Look, I, uh, a few months ago, I wrote a piece um, uh, talking about an investment agreement that could potentially uh, incorporate the U.S., China, and the U.K., okay? If you did that, you would have the top two financial markets in the world and the top two economies in the world all in the same agreement. So I believe that would be a very solid approach for an investment agreement, both portfolio and uh, and foreign direct investment, okay? Now, I think it's been um, kind of the containment strategy of China has been a fairly naive kind of 20th century strategy. So the U.S. has to move forward and regional players have to move forward incorporating China and incorporating the larger players. I think if that happens, you know, as a starting point, China is already the top trading partner of every single country in Asia. And they're, if not the top, they're in the top two investment partners for almost every country in Asia. So they have to be included. And that more integrated approach, I think, understands. If you look at the RCEP negotiations just from yesterday, okay, it was accepted to have both goods and services bound together in RCEP, okay? If China wasn't um, willing to uh, give on some of these negotiations, they would not have bound services and goods together, where services clearly benefits India and goods clearly benefits China.